And it came to pass that after I, the Lord God, had driven them out, that Adam began to till the earth and to have dominion over the beasts of the field and to eat his bread by the sweat of his brow, as I, the Lord God, had commanded him. And Eve also, his wife, did labor with him. And Adam and Eve, his wife, called upon the name of the Lord. And they heard the voice of the Lord, and he gave unto them commandments. And Adam and Eve blessed the name of God, and they made all things known unto their sons and their daughters. The Lord from the very beginning has taught his children of their obligation and responsibility to look after one another. In the days of Adam and the early fathers, it was generally the eldest father who was called upon to exercise his patriarchal responsibility to watch over the family. As the children of the Lord increased in number, the principle of watching over the church by the priesthood was the Lord's way of seeing that fathers did their duty, as well as assisting them in that responsibility. A study of mankind will reveal that every time the Lord has established His church on earth, one of the distinguishing characteristics has been a system of watching over and strengthening the membership. Moses, after being given the awesome responsibility of leading the children of Israel out of bondage, was taught this principle by his father-in-law. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat in the judgment of the people. And the people stood by Moses from morning until evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand before thee from morn until eve? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of, the, of God. And his father-in-law said unto him, This thing which thou doest is not good. For thou shalt surely wear away, both thou and this people with thee. Hearken now to my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and God will be with thee. So Moses hearkened unto the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he said. And Moses chose able men out of Israel, and made them heads of the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifty and rulers of tens. When the Savior was on earth and the number grew who followed him, he organized a system to teach and take care of their needs also. First he called twelve. Then as the work expanded, the scriptures are record, after these things the Lord appointed others, seventy also, and sent them two by two before his face unto every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore he said unto them, The harvest is truly great, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labors unto his harvest. As his church continued to expand, we find more of his organization being put into place. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying the body of Christ, till we all come to a unity of the faith and of a knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine and by the slide of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Through the ages, the process of watching over the church has become a priesthood assignment 
and responsibility. One would expect, therefore, in the restoration of the gospel in this day, that this principle to watch over would be clearly evident as one of the basic programs of the church. In the revelation on the organization and government of the church as given to the prophet Joseph Smith in April 1830, this principle was again established. This revelation instructs the teacher's duty is to watch over the church always and to be with and strengthen them and see that there is no iniquity in the church, neither hardness with each other, neither lying, backbiting, nor evil speaking, to see that the church meet together often and also see that all members do their duty. They are, however, to warn, expound, exhort, and teach and invite all to come unto Christ. There is a choice account of how this practice was carried on in the early days of the church. History has recorded the testimony of Elder William Farrington Cahoon as he filled an assignment as a teacher to the home of the prophet Joseph Smith. The account is as follows. Before I close my testimony, I wish to mention one circumstance I shall never forget. I was called and ordained to act as a teacher and to visit the homes of the saints. I got along very well until I found out that I was obliged to pay a call and pay a visit on the prophet. Being young, only 17 years of age, I felt a weakness in visiting the prophet and his family in the capacity of a teacher. I almost felt like shrinking from my duty. Finally, I went to the door and knocked. In a moment, the prophet came to the door. I stood there trembling and said, Brother Joseph, I have come to visit you in the capacity of a teacher, if it is convenient for you. He said, Brother William, come right in. I'm glad to see you. Sit down in that chair there, and I will go and call my family. They soon came in and took their seats. Then he said, Brother William, I submit myself and my family in your hands. And then he took his seat. Now, Brother William, he said, ask all the questions you feel like. By that time, my fear and trembling had ceased. And I said, Brother Joseph, are you trying to live your religion? He answered, yes. Then I said, do you pray in your family? He said, yes. Do you teach your family the principles of the gospel? He replied, yes, I am trying to do it. Do you ask a blessing on the food? His answer was again, yes. Are you trying to live in peace and harmony with all of your family? He said that he was. Then I turned to Sister Emma, his wife, and said, Sister Emma, are you trying to live your religion? Do you teach your children to obey their parents? Do you try to teach them to pray? To all of these questions, she answered, Yes, I am trying to do so. Then I turned to Joseph and said, I am now through with my questions as a teacher. Now, if you have any instructions to give, I will be happy to receive them. He said, God bless you, Brother William. If you are humble and faithful, you shall have the power to settle all difficulties that may come to you in the capacity as a teacher. I then left my parting blessing on the family as a teacher and took my departure. In the beginning, with Father Adam down to the present, when the Lord's Church has been organized on the, the earth, there has been a system a program to have brotherly and sisterly concern one for another. The history of these general conferences is filled with discourses of brethren who remind us of this sacred obligation. I have been impressed to add my voice to that record today with the hope that we can be motivated in our callings as home teachers to give them the proper priority in our lives. 
Let me remind you of three essential ingredients to this home teaching program. First, the family is the basic organization of the church. The home teacher is the first line of defense to watch over and strengthen that basic unit. In our priorities of time commitments, we ought to first watch over and strengthen our own families, then be good, consistent, conscientious home teachers. Joseph F. Smith said in the General Conference of 1915, I don't know of any duty that is more sacred or necessary if it is carried out that, as it should be than the duty to teach and visit the homes of the people, pray with them, and admonish them to virtue and honor, to unity, to love, and faith in and fidelity in the cause of Zion. Home teachers, it is your job to see that the unbaptized are baptized. The unordained are ordained. The inactive are brought into activity. The lost members are found. Second, just as Moses was not able to care for all the needs of the children of Israel, so a home teacher should not be given an assignment beyond his ability to perform. The history of home teaching and ward teaching has witnessed a change in the number of recommended assignments to families, reduced from 10 to 8 to the present level of 5 or less as the church has enlarged its borders and the distance to travel has increased. Nothing will destroy the spirit of a home teacher more than to give him an assignment beyond his ability to have the thrill and success in his performance. Stake presidents, bishops, and quorum leaders there is no program in the church that will give you greater relief from your administrative burdens and to carry out a well-organized, efficiently operated, successful home teaching program. Third, the preparation of a home teacher. Matthias F. Cowley reported in General Conference of April 1902, the teachers who go out to visit the saints from family to family, ought to be men endowed with a spirit of revelation from God. They ought to study the principles of the gospel and live so that they may enjoy the inspiration from the Holy Ghost in their instructions, so that their instructions may be understood and attractive to the children, that there sh they should not simply go out to carry out a routine, to ask certain questions, just to be able to say, I have made a monthly visit. They ought to be men inspired with the spirit and revelation from God that they touch the hearts of the families. If our home teaching assignments were to be given their proper priority, then our preparation for those visits must be careful and complete, tailored to the individual needs of fathers and mothers and their families as home teachers. Should not this basic program receive our earnest effort to seek the inspiration and guidance from the Lord in this most sacred obligation? God grant us the vision to see our potential as home teachers in our assignments to the families we have been given, and a desire to watch over and strengthen those to whom we have been called to serve with a special interest, a special love, and special concern, I humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.